Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to the Vine. Oh, goodness. Uh, here at the Vine, we are a community of believers who are striving to be rooted in God, growing in Christ, and reaching the world. And we are so glad that you're worshiping with us today. Uh, if you are visiting with us this morning, we are especially glad that you are here. We have information um, about our church in the foyer. On a table back there, there's visitor cards, coffees, restrooms. It's all back there in the back. Um, for families with young kids, we are glad that you are joining us today also. We have a kids table in the back that is pretty full right now with colors and stickers and crayons. Um, during wor during uh, Warren's sermon, the ages three years old through second grade will be able to go to children's church. Um, and then there is a, another little cry room in the back if you need that as well with some little toys and things in there. Um, today I'll be reading excerpts from Psalm 4. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy. When their grain and new wine abound, in peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Will you join us now in a time of silence and reflection as we prepare for our time of worship? And after this, we will pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Thank you guys for being here with us today. If you would please stand, we're going to begin our time of praise. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise, the treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along, you put me back together in every desire. Now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me great. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place. Your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. You 
turn morning to dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn grace into guidance You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who cares You turn mourning to dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who cares You're the only one who cares Oh, there's nothing better than you Lord, there's nothing There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, and nothing is better than you. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you You called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into now your mercy has saved my soul Now your freedom is all I know The old made new When I met you you call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into your glorious day I'll be the rescue My 
my sin was heavy but chains break at the weight of your glory i needed shelter i was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven when i was broken you were my healer now your love is the air that i'm breathing i have a future my eyes are open when you call my name and i ran out of that grace out of the darkness into your glorious day you call my name and i ran out of that grace out of the darkness into your glorious day Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaken, I'll never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I built my life on Jesus And He's never let me down He's faithful in every season So why would He fail now? He won't, he won't, he won't fail, he won't fail, he won't, he won't. He won't fail, he won't
Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, with everything around me shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, he's never let me down. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. He won't fail. He won't fail. He won't. will 
will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to only it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. be seated. I rest in you, O oh God. I am in your safekeeping, body and soul held in peace. My heart cries out to you, my God. All that upsets me you see. All that disturbs me, you understand. Only here, in your presence, am I fully known. I am wrapped in grace. I rest in you, O oh God. I am in your safekeeping. Body and soul held in peace. I try to relax, but anger rattles me. I try to relax, but my feelings niggle at me. Be still. Be silent. Put your trust in the Lord. I rest in you, O oh God. I am in your safekeeping. Body and soul held in peace. In the stillness, the light of your face shines. My heart turns to thankfulness and is glad. I have more than enough. You, Lord, are more than enough. I lie down to sleep safe and sound. I rest in you, O oh God. I am in your safekeeping, body and soul held in peace. Be still and rest. You are held in peace. Good morning. It's good to see everybody today. I know some of you started school this past week, so you may be watching that video thinking, I can't be held in peace right now. <laughs> there is no peace. So hopefully uh, today brings a bit of peace and rest for you, and you can take some encouragement in, in being here this morning. Uh, we're going to go ahead and dismiss our kids for Children's Church, so they're going to head out to the other building that's three years old through second grade. They're going to go and have a grand time over there. We, we have uh, been taking a break from our classes over the summer, and so those will start back up. We're planning to start those back up in September, where we'll have classes again after our worship service on Sunday mornings. But for today and next week, just as a reminder, we're going to have some ministry meetings the next couple of Sundays. And so this morning after worship, 
uh, we'll have a meeting for our audiovisual ministry crew, whatever, uh, that we are were, we going to meet in here. We'll just gather at the back of the auditorium back here after worship. And then the other meeting is going to be about youth and our kids and youth ministries in the other building in the fellowship hall. And so if you are interested in being involved in either of those ministries, if you have, certainly if you have kids, uh, then you'll want to be a part of that meeting probably. Uh, or if you want to be involved, if you have kids who want to be involved in the AV ministry, they can come over here and, and hang out with us. We've got teens who, who help out with that, and uh, it's a good place for teens to plug in because they get all the technology stuff, and it's very easy to teach our teens how to do it. So, um, And so if, if there's anywhere you want to plug in, or if you've got questions about those ministries, ideas, whatever, we hope you'll stick around and be a part of those conversations today. Uh, let me pray for us, and then we'll get into to our lesson. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for this place. Thank you for these people. Thank you for your word, God, and for the diversity of stories that we find in your word. God, as we look at one of those stories today, uh, I pray that you open our hearts, our minds, to what you might have for each of us in this story. God, thank you for your love for us, and thank you for the capacity that we have to love others, and help us to do that well. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. So we are going to return to our series that we've been going through on 1 Samuel today. We took a break last week for Back to School Sunday, and so we're back in it this week. And there, there are several reasons I wanted to do this series, but one of the reasons is 1 Samuel has just many, I think, riveting and meaningful stories in it, but it also has some stories in it that are pretty unique to Scripture that we don't really find anywhere else within the canon of Scripture. And so today's story is, is one of those unique stories, I think. And it's a story that's not necessarily, you know, with David and Goliath, we had the long narrative that we went through. This is a story that's kind of told in bits and pieces over the course of 1 Samuel. So we're going to kind of jump around to some different spots uh, this morning. But first, there's a couple of things I want to do by way of kind of introduction and setup before we get to, to all that this morning. First, as, as I'm sure that many or maybe all of you know, we at The Vine, we're an open and affirming church. And so I think every once in a while, it's probably good just to kind of say, what does that mean? Because I know that's kind of a churchy language. If you're not familiar with kind of church lingo and language, you may not even kind of know what those words mean or that sort of designation means. And so broadly what it means is that there are no barriers to membership or involvement based on gender, gender identity, race, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, political affiliation, or any other designation that you might could throw out there that tends to divide us up into us and them. Uh, like, those people can't belong. Uh, we try not to have those barriers, is basically what that means. Functionally, th functionally, then, what that primarily means for how we look different from kind of many other churches is that there are no limits for women or women's involvement or places in leadership and we are fully inclusive of the LGBTQ community. So functionally, that's kind of where the, the differences lie between us and at least many other churches. And so I, I mention that in part, like I said, it's probably just good to, to reiterate every once in a while for new folks, but also because when we were going through sort of our discernment process about whether we were going to you know, openly say that we were inclusive of LGBTQ individuals, as you might imagine, there were a lot of scriptural arguments that we heard to not do that uh, and to state something else instead. And so, of course, there are what are commonly referred to as the clobber passages, and so we went through all those with many people. But then another common argument that at least I heard from many people at that time was something along the lines of, well, even if you can sort of interpret or understand those scriptures in a different way, we still don't have any examples of same-sex couples in the canon of scripture. This was something that people would say to me. You, you can't point to any marriage or relationship between two individuals of the same gender in scripture. 
And at the time, it was a point that I at least sort of conceded to them. It wasn't convincing to me that that means that we shouldn't, you know, accept those or whatever. But it was a point, I was like, okay, you've got a point. Uh, I now don't think it's as clear. And so the story that we're going to look at today is one of the stories, and I think probably the most convincing story of where there might not be, you might not can say that fully or truthfully, that there are no same-sex relationships um, in Scripture. And so, again, such a statement, I think, needs to acknowledge the possibility of one relationship that we just so happen to find in 1 Samuel, and that is the relationship between David and Jonathan. So there are other relationships and other individuals that some people will point to as possibilities. I, I happen to think that we probably too narrowly think about what eunuchs mean and refer to in the canon of Scripture. I think it's entirely possible that eunuchs refer to a, a sexual minority of some sort that could maybe have much broader, again, sort of understandings than we typically think of it. But if you're looking for a story of a romantic or sexual relationship between two individuals of the same gender, I personally think that your best option is David and Jonathan. And so after today, if someone tells you there aren't any same-sex relationships in Scripture, you can say, well, what about David and Jonathan? And they'll either have no idea what you're talking about, or they will immediately have a long response to it because they've heard that argument before. <laughs> It'll be one of those two options. Um, but you can try it out and see what happens. Uh, so, I wanted to explore their story today partly because of that. And this, this story, I originally, in my original sort of concept of this series, I was just going to have like one line about David and Jonathan in one of my sermons, and uh, then that turned into a whole sermon. So this is why I don't always get to all the material that I have planned for series, because sometimes one line becomes a whole sermon. <laughs> and so it may feel like we don't necessarily cover, cover a lot of ground today, but I think this is, at least to me, an interesting enough and perhaps relevant enough topic to, to really kind of dig into and spend some time on. So that's what we're going to do. And we haven't really talked any about Jonathan yet in this series, but he has shown up in several places over the course of the book so far. And so if you were just reading through 1 Samuel, you would have already been introduced to Jonathan, even though we haven't talked about him much here. There are some very interesting stories, in fact, about Jonathan already. Uh, for instance, there's one story in which his dad almost has to kill him because he ate some honey. Like, that's an actual story that's in there. You can go read it later. But Jonathan got hungry, ate some honey, and then for reasons that I won't get into because it'd be too long of a story, his dad almost had to kill him. Uh, we have actually met Jonathan's dad, who just so happens to be Saul, or the embattled King Saul that we've talked about several times. And so as Saul's son, from a worldly sort of perspective, David and Jonathan should be the fiercest of rivals. Because, again, John, uh, Saul is the first of Israel's kings. And if you're going kind of by the worldly way that, you know, whoever is going to follow Saul as king goes, it should be Jonathan. By worldly standards, Jonathan should be next in line for king of Israel. But David is the God-anointed heir to the throne. And so, again, from a worldly perspective, Jonathan should be very resentful and bitter towards David. And these two guys should be rivals. But they are anything but. They are quite fond of each other, as we're going to see. Uh, it's not hard, again, to imagine that their relationship could be filled with tension and conflict, but that's not what we find at all. The way that David and Jonathan's relationship is described, is described is very unique to anything else we see in Scripture. There are other cases where two individuals of the same gender show or express love toward each other, but in those situations, they are always related, either by birth or marriage. And while David and Jonathan do end up being related by marriage later, which we'll get to in a little bit, their relationship starts well before that. And specifically, we first read about them together in 1 Samuel 18. So that's where we're going to pick up. If you want to follow along, you can turn with us or click over or whatever to 1 Samuel 18. It's going to be on the screen as well. And let me just say before we get into this, 
I do not think we have enough information in this story to know the exact nature of their relationship. But I almost think that the ambiguity there is sort of helpful and, and I think beautiful in a way. And so I'll, I'll come back to that again later, but I just want to say that from the beginning. My, my, um, my task or my goal today is not to convince you that they were in a romantic or sexual relationship. It's just for us to sort of explore their story and then kind of find what, what it might be saying to us or what we might can take from it individually. So just wanted to state that at the beginning here. Uh, so 1 Samuel 18. So right before this, 17 ends with the David and Goliath story, and then this is right after the David and Goliath narrative, we find this. It says, After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. So that's the initial description that we have of this relationship between David and Jonathan. That they became one in spirit, they made a covenant with each other, and after they make this covenant, it appears as if at least one of them just disrobes and takes off their clothes. And so, of course, some people will say that David and Jonathan are just really good friends, which is, again, is entirely possible. Um, it's possible that we just don't value friendship, you know, deep and meaningful friendship enough between two individuals of the same gender. That's entirely possible. But, as Maverick's laughter just let you know, this feels like a lot for a friendship, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, I think we can just acknowledge that. And again, maybe that's entirely cultural. Maybe we just miss something about affection between friends who are not romantically involved. But it does feel like a lot. Uh, again, if you're just talking about friends. And so, we then learn uh, that, again, so Jonathan doesn't see David as a threat at all, obviously. The dude just gave him his sword. Uh, but, so he doesn't see him as a threat at all, but Saul, his dad, certainly does. And so what happens after this is Saul begins sending David out on basically military campaigns, and David starts going out on these campaigns in which he is very successful. And so there begins to be this refrain then that the women of Israel would sing when David came back from battle, and it would go like this. I'm not going to sing it. That would have been great if I just broke out into song. But uh, I don't know the tune. Uh, it said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. So again, this is an ancient book. Uh, Saul basically gets mad that, or uh, sort of jealous that David is more successful in war crimes than he is. I mean, that's essentially what we're talking about here. So I get that we have some issues from a modern perspective with just a lot of what happens in 1 Samuel, including this. Uh, but this makes Saul just, just furious. And so this is where Saul's mission begins to kill David. And it's a years-long pursuit that basically takes place the rest of Saul's life. He's just obsessed with killing David. Most of the time, he kind of waffles back and forth, but it goes on. And so he initially tried to get Jonathan and his men to kill David, but of course, as you could likely guess by now, Jonathan's not going to do it. He says, nope, I'm not doing that. And he even convinces his dad to stop trying to kill him until Saul gets angry again. And so then he tries again. He, this time, he gets another group of men to go to his house to try to kill him. But this is where the family drama and political intrigue just continues to grow. Because it just so happens that Jonathan had a sister who was also in love with David. Deep emotional connections to David <laughs> in Saul's family, one way or another. He either hated him or loved him, it seemed. So uh, Michal, Saul's daughter, is in love with David. And so Saul has this idea. He's like, I know how to keep David close, basically, you know, keep your friends close and enemies closer. He's like, I'll give Michal to David in marriage. And so typically, if you were going to marry the king's daughter, like that was something only a wealthy person could do, because you would basically have to pay the king, 
in order to have the right to marry his daughter. But David, or excuse me, Saul is like, nope, I don't need any money for this one. He's, here's what he says, again, because he just wants to keep David close. And so he says, I kid you not, if you bring me a hundred Philistines foreskins, you can marry my daughter. So David's like, all right, cool. There's, there's a lot of emphasis on male genitalia in 1 Samuel. Just, uh, I should have said at the beginning, this is a PG-13 sermon. Sorry if I, I didn't give that, that at the beginning. Uh, so David's like, all right, cool, I could do that. He goes out, kills 200 Philistines, brings back 200 foreskins, and so he double the amount. So all right, cool. Uh, so he gets to marry Michal. Well, then it just so happens uh, that Michal warns David about this impending plot to kill him, and so David gets out of it then as well. And uh, another quick side note, David does end up marrying several women, but you can make the case, I think, that just about all of his marriages are really for political or power dynamic reasons. Even his most famous relationship with Bathsheba is basically an imbalance of power uh, and influence. And so every relationship that he has with women seems to be tied to power or political sort of expediency in some way. We are actually never told that David loves Michal. We're told repeatedly that he loved Jonathan, but never Michal. Uh, We are instead only told that David was pleased to become the king's son-in-law. That's it. Again, so politics. This is all politics for David. So, back to killing Saul, I mean killing David. Uh, The first time Saul's son, who loved David, stopped Saul. This time Saul's daughter, who loved David, finds out, warns David. And so now that David knows this information, again, he goes back to Jonathan and is like, dude, your dad's trying to kill me. What's up? I haven't done anything to the guy. (laughs) And Jonathan's like, no, not trying to kill you. He told me he would stop, and my dad doesn't do anything without telling me. So they kind of go back and forth for a little while until they decide, okay, we're going to devise this test to see if Saul wants to kill David. So they kind of set up this whole ruse in order to kind of see uh, who is right. And of course, as they're plotting their scheme, they reaffirm their oath to each other and their love for each other. And as part of the ruse that the two of them set up, one in which Jonathan was in attendance at this dinner, this banquet, but David was noticeably absent, Saul gets so mad at Jonathan that he throws his spear at Jonathan in an effort to kill Jonathan. So now he's mad at both of them and tries to kill them both. And so at that point, Jonathan's like, okay, now I see it. This is serious. I think he wants David dead. (laughs) Uh, Officially, it says, after he had the spear thrown at him, then Jonathan knew that his father intended to kill David. But I like to imagine that he kind of has this moment of clarity and says something similar to what Keegan-Michael Key says at the end of this Key and Peel sketch. Something like this. Now I see it. Now I see it. <laughs> uh, that whole sketch is funny. If you haven't seen it, I'll tell you which one it is later. But, um, but he has this kind of moment of clarity where he's like, ah, I, I, I get it. I see it. So he runs back out then. He meets back up with David. Uh, Jonathan now has this newfound information. He runs to meet David in a field where David has been hiding and waiting. And so this is very like Hallmark movie-esque or something where they're now running towards each other in this field. Uh, they, and here's what we're told about that meeting then. It says, David got up from the south side of the stone and bowed down before Jonathan three times with his face to the ground. Then they kissed each other and wept together. But David wept the most. Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then then David left, and Jonathan went back to the town. Now, that functionally pretty much ends their relationship, at least in terms of what we are told of their story. They're separate for pretty much the rest of their lives. And so it's a very tragic story in many ways. Again, regardless of what the nature of their relationship is, friendship, romantic, or whatever, it it ends here in sort of a very tragic way, where they now have to be separate because Jonathan's dad's trying to kill David. 
And even there in, in that text, I think we see another issue that, you know, occasionally I'll talk about sort of issues that translations kind of present to us in ways that they can kind of impact how we read things. Because there's actually no word for friendship in the text. So the NIV says we've sworn friendship to each other. But literally, it just says something like we have sworn with each other. The, the friendship is added in as sort of an interpretation about, well, these two must be friends, so we're going to add in they've sworn friendship to each other. But literally, it just says something like go in peace in what we have sworn, and then kind of goes into the rest of it, which is them declaring that they will take care of their descendants from that point forward, which is something they repeatedly come back to and, and sort of remind each other of, that they're going to make sure their families are taken care of if one of them dies, which again, indicates incredible intimacy and closeness, whatever you think the nature of their relationship is. And we see later, after Jonathan dies, David does take care of his descendants and his kids and make sure that they're always taken care of. So then later, at the beginning of 2 Samuel, when David does find out that both Saul and Jonathan have died, he laments their deaths, saying this of Jonathan. He says, I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. And so in that short little phrase there, I think once again, we see the depth of their relationship, but also the ambiguity. Uh, you can make a case here that, yeah, they, just, they were like siblings. They were so close, they were like siblings. David even says brother. But then you can say, well, but that's very weird to say that his love, or not weird, it would be uh, odd to say your love for me was more wonderful than that of women if he wasn't talking about a romantic type of love. And so some people will try to explain it away differently, but whatever the case there's ambiguity here, and there's also, obviously, an incredible amount of intimacy and, and closeness between the two of them. And so the admittedly scant information that we have about David and Jonathan's relationship has led to, of course, many questions about the nature of their relationship. Were they involved romantically? And if so, what does that say about David? Uh, while they would not have used the terminology that we use in a modern sense, it may make us wonder from a modern perspective, so does this mean that David was gay? Was he bisexual? Uh, or would such a rendering be reading too much into a strong bond between two men? Is it simply sexualizing a friendship that was so strong that they became one in spirit? Are the elements of the story that lead us to see them as romantically involved simply cultural in nature? And so again, in the end, I don't think that we have enough information to definitively describe their relationship, nor do we know anything about their desires or their motivations for their relationship. However, I do think we can say this. I think that if Disney made an animated kids movie about David and Jonathan's story, it would 100% get protested by certain people. <laughs> Um, and so I even, i in fact, I sort of, I don't remember what I Googled to find this, but there was a puppet show that someone tried to do about their relationship for kids in Minas somewhere in Minnesota, I think, and a group found out about it, uh, and got them to cancel the puppet show at Kansas. It was in Kansas. That's where it was. Um, because they were trying to do a puppet show about David and Jonathan's story. And if you just tell David and Jonathan's story without any other context behind it, it seems like they are pretty romantically involved. Uh, and again, this idea that it would not be met well by everyone, I think what especially tr would be especially true if you told the story without using their names or attaching it to the Bible even. Uh, I mean, you can imagine a story about two men who, two, who should be rivals falling in love only to have to say goodbye to each other forever because one of their dads wants to kill the other one. I mean, that's, that could be a good movie. <laughs> it would not be a movie everyone would love, but you can sell that as a plot for a movie. And so I, I mention that to say that context matters. Context matters. Uh, because for some, the fact that it's in the Bible already means that it can't be a story about two men who would love each other in a sexual way. But, but 
having that opinion about the story, I think, requires you to sort of overlay an idea of Scripture over the top of this story. Uh, most of the arguments that I hear against David and Jonathan being romantically involved usually sort of is based around this idea that, well, the rest of Scripture is clear about homosexuality and same-sex relationships, and so it can't be that. Again, I don't agree with that assessment of the rest of Scripture, but that's the argument. Uh, but you have to kind of have that way of seeing Scripture and then overlay that on top of this in order to sort of definitively say that they are not. Uh, so, for some, like I said, since it's in the Bible, it already means, well, they can't be. For others, the unique nature of the story adds richness to the Bible, and the fact that their story is unique within the context of Scripture doesn't demand that it be read in a certain way. It can beautifully and simply be unique. But, like I said, ultimately, I don't think we have nearly enough information to make any type of definitive declaration about the nature of their relationship. But I think the fact that it's ambiguous is actually helpful and, and beautiful in some ways, as I mentioned earlier. Because I, th I think one of the things that's interesting about it is that the First Samuel writers and, and editors don't seem to be going out of their way to clarify whether or not David and Jonathan had a sexual relationship. And if they did try to make it clear, the clarity was lost in translation or is not discernible to us for cultural reasons, basically. And to be fair, you have to fill in some gaps in order to say that they do have a sexual relationship with each other. Uh, but again, that's because it's not clear either way. But it is telling to me that you seemingly can't arrive at really either option from what we have. And so that may make you wonder, well, why spend so much time on this story and their relationship then if you're going to say, well, we don't know and we, we can't make any firm declarations about it? But again, I think that's sort of the beauty of the story. I think there's beauty in the ambiguity and in the fact that the ambiguity affords space for many of us to find ourselves somewhere in David's story. For instance, when we think about David, based on what we know of his relationship with Don Jonathan, we are left with sort of three choices from our kind of modern understanding of relationships and sexuality. Uh, one could be that David is a straight man with an incredibly deep, romantic, or deep emotional connection to a male friend. Two, perhaps David is bisexual and enjoys sexual relationships with women and at least one man that we know of. Three, perhaps David is gay and all of his relationships with women are simply tied to power and influence. And even suggesting that David is gay, I know is not something I would have been able to do in churches for a long time, so I'm glad that I at least feel like I can do that now. Uh, again, not saying he was, just throwing it out as an option. And I think it's beautiful then that most of us can find ourselves and our story somewhere in David's story. David's story allows gay, bisexual, and straight individuals to see at least a bit of themselves in David. So, for instance, if you are a man who struggles with male friendship, in particular a straight man who struggles with maintaining male friendships, perhaps you can take some comfort in David's story. Male friendship, especially amongst adults, is a, an issue for us in America. Uh, more than half of men in America report feeling unsatisfied with the size of their friend group. And there are many reasons why men in our culture struggle to develop and maintain friendships with other men in adulthood. But maybe David's story can provide needed encouragement to know that it is not only possible, but also life-giving and uh, enriching to develop a, a deep emotional connection with another man. And let me just say, while there are many reasons for sort of the dearth of male friendships that exist in our culture, I do think that deeply embedded homophobia plays a big role in that. Uh, because for many of us, especially many of us as adults who grew up in, you know, 80s or 90s or even before that, I'm sure, um, as straight men, there's this sort of deeply held fear of appearing feminine or gay. And so anything that appears to be those things, we tend to push away. 
And that includes deep emotional connections with other people, but a certainly deep emotional connections with other men. And so we tend not to pursue those. There's a lot more to be said there, but I, I think perhaps simply there's some encouragement we can take there from David's story. Uh, if you are a straight woman, for instance, then, who values your friendships with other women or someone other than your spouse, if you're married, uh, and have found deep value in an emotional connection there with someone else, perhaps you can take comfort in the friendship between David and Jonathan. Uh, according to one study, 60% of 60-year-old men say that their best friend is their wife. But interestingly, only 30% of women of the same age say that their best friend is their husband. So more women, again, have deep emotional connections with other people besides their spouse. And so perhaps that's what we see here in David's story, that he has this deep emotional connection with someone else that's not one of his, in David's case, eight wives, but that's the story for another day too. Uh, if you are a member of the LGBTQ community, Perhaps you can take comfort in seeing your experience and story played out in the pages of Scripture. If you've been told that there is no one like you in the Bible, then perhaps David's story is a crucial and needed oasis. That David's story may at least sound like your experience or look like your experience, at least in some way. And to be clear, David isn't like an afterthought in the biblical narr narrative. If you're going to do a, a Mount Rushmore of the key figures in the Old Testament, David is on it. Uh, Jesus' line, lineage, is tied back to David. Jesus is from David's hometown of Bethlehem. Like, David is a big deal in the Old Testament. And so to have all these types of stories about David included in the canon, I think that's one of the reasons 1 Samuel digs in so deep into this kind of time in Israel's history is because David has a crucial role in the story from this point forward. And so we kind of zoom in on this time uh, to get these stories, and we learn a lot about him in this section. So there is a contemporary artist named Katie Miles Wallace, who she herself identifies as queer, and she has painted a series of paintings entitled Queer Saints. And included in that series is this painting, this piece, that depicts the relationship between Jonathan and David. And so she, uh, I read an interview that she did about this series that you can find online. And in response to a question about her own sexuality and art, she had this to say. She said, as for my faith... I think all LGBTQIA plus people, really all minority people, have a unique perspective on crucifixion and resurrection, especially out LGBTQIA plus people who know what it means to dwell in the tomb or closet and then be free. We get it in a way that hetero folks can't. And to me... What I think that represents is the beauty of diversity within the body. That there are things that other people experience and there are parts of other people's story that help add richness to the story of Christ and to our understanding of God and Scripture in a way that I can never fully grasp. Uh, I think I may have told this story before, but... Um, Someone once asked me, what, what, it, what did it do to the culture of our church once we were openly an affirming church and inclusive of LGBTQ individuals? And I said, I think it's made us a more empathetic church. Um, because when you understand someone else's story and experience, and when they can share how that has impacted their own life and story, I think it helps us to develop empathy it helps us to develop, I think, spiritual humility, where maybe my way of understanding Scripture isn't the only way. Maybe my way of connecting to God isn't the only way. And so I think it has done that within our church, and I think she sort of speaks to that in that quote that she gave. I think it's beautiful that, that we need each other to have our understanding of Scripture deepened and enriched. 
And it's part of what I think we attempt to do in communion each Sunday, is to be reminded not only of the bond that we have with Christ, but the bond that we have with each other. That this is a part of the service where we are each taking the elements of communion together. Uh, We are each eating the same bread and drinking the same juice. Not from the same cup, luckily, but, but symbolically, we are all drinking from the same juice and the same bread as a way of reminding us of our connectivity to each other and our connectivity in, to Christ. And so this is, a, this is a time in our service where we're going to do that. We're going to share in communion, and uh, everyone is invited to participate. If you do not want to, that's quite all right, but everyone is invited to, to take of the bread and the juice, which represents uh, Christ's body and blood uh, that he gave on the cross. And so it is a time to remember those things, to remember our connections, and to hopefully Uh, be a source of strengthening and encouraging each of us this morning. And so we're going to pray our prayer of confession as we head into that, and I'll pray the the words in white, and then collectively we'll pray the words in yellow, and then share in our time of communion this morning. So let's pray. God, we confess to each other and to you, our Creator, that we fall short of being what we were created to be and what we have committed ourselves to be. Hear us, forgive us, Renew our resolve to build the kingdom of Christ. We often seek out the easiest paths, paths of least involvement in places where we might be uncomfortable or paths of self-centeredness. Hear us, forgive us, renew our resolve to build the kingdom of righteousness. We confess that we have not loved you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. Bring us out of darkness, Lord, and into the light of your love. Hear us, forgive us, renew our resolve to build the kingdom of light. Forgive us for getting so caught up in the world's trappings and its false messages of hope that we lose sight of the hope of the kingdom, which brings healing and peace to a world in turmoil. Hear us, forgive us, renew our resolve to build the kingdom of peace. May we resolve to become more kingdom-minded, to be peacemakers here and now. Amen. Stop. 
for my ransom and rose up on the third day. My God is greater than death. Doesn't already know There's no problem to be No weapon too strong There is nothing for God That's impossible There's no mountain too high No valley too low There's no fear that I have He doesn't already know There's no problem to be No weapon too strong There is nothing for God that's impossible I won't be shaken Oh, I won't be moved My God is faithful His promise is true So I speak to the man God is bigger, better, stronger, greater, bigger, better, stronger, greater, bigger, better, stronger, greater than you. As has been mentioned already, we want to say again, welcome all of our guests. Thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, trusting us enough to be a space where you can come and be connected to others and to God and find these uh, relationships. Um, as Warren sent out uh, what he might be uh, speaking about, he just mentioned bigger themes can be loving one another in relationships. And as the series is titled, you know, um, Heard by God. And I, uh, for those of you who don't know, maybe you're new, I'm a hospice chaplain. And so I get to walk with people um, who are facing uh, the end of their life here on earth and their families. And you might think that the deepest need that the dying need at those last moments are to be comforted and to be reassured that um, that you're going to be okay in death. You know. However, uh, it's I've discovered it's built within us to be able, when we get to those moments, to be able to manage being dead. <coughs> Now, what's really difficult is the process of dying. None of us really want to um, look forward to that. <coughs> Excuse me. But what people do want to hear, their greatest need, is to be seen and heard, to be known, fully known, and loved. And I, I just think that goes really well with uh, Warren's uh, message today is we all just genuinely want to be known and heard and loved and certainly as is a big story among us the LGBTQ community 
uh, being heard and known and seen and loved. But as I've been in uh, Houston as a chaplain and here in uh, Central Texas as a chaplain, uh, that goes for uh, Muslims, especially after 9-11. Um, it goes for uh, some of you, maybe back in the day, uh, the, the Japanese here in this country after World War II. Um, there are just communities of people that need to be seen and loved and known for who they are and not what they are perceived to be. And so as we think about what this sermon might call us to do, um, let it call us to go out and to be a safe space for people, to hold space for people, to be themselves, uh, to be heard and seen and known and loved. Uh, before I close this in prayer, I just wanted to remind everybody once again that our, our ministry meetings are going to be right after our worship today. Uh, the AV is going to meet back here in the back, and then children's ministry is going to meet uh, over in the other building in the uh, fellowship space. So let's pray. God, thank you for this morning and for this message, a message of being willing to uh, be a space for people to be themselves, to be known, and to be heard by you and by us. So God, as we go out, may we, be, may we hold that space for people to be themselves and to know that they are loved for who they truly are. So God, may you just pour through us the gift of your spirit of love that we may embrace people and that they may feel embraced by you through our touch and through our loving arms. In the name of the one who walked this earth and experienced all things human, despair, marginalization, and yes, love, we pray, Jesus Christ, our Lord.